Hey guys, Callum here. In today's video, I'm going to be talking through how you can get the best bed layer adhesion for your 3D prints. Let's go. So if you have a 3D printer, you may well have already come across this as a problem. If you haven't, then I'm sure you will at some point. Bed layer adhesion can be a pain in the neck. So I've tried to prepare the most comprehensive guide I can on how you can improve bed adhesion and a step-by-step -step guide explaining each of these points. Let's start from the beginning. Step one, level your bed. One of the most important factors in getting that first layer right is having a perfectly level bed or as close to it as you possibly can. This is such a big topic and an important topic that I've prepared a separate video for that and you can find that here. So assuming you've got your bed level now, I will continue with the rest of the steps. Step two, get your speed right. Now the first layer speed is a really important factor in how well the print stays adhered to the bed. If you print too quickly, the material is actually more likely to stay adhered to the nozzle, curl up around the nozzle and not stick to the bed at all. Uh, so that's not good. When you're watching your print go down, if the material is staying sort of adhered to the nozzle itself and being pulled off the bed as it prints, then you are probably printing too fast. As a rule of thumb, I would suggest a first layer speed of 15 to 20 millimeters per second. Step three, first layer height. Now this is a step which I think is overlooked in a lot of guides on how to get really good bed adhesion. And in my opinion, it's probably one of the most important factors in getting good bed adhesion. Why? Well, if you print with a thicker first layer, you're effectively giving yourself a much greater margin of error in your bed leveling. If you've only got a 0.1 millimeter first layer, then that's the absolute maximum margin you've got in the levelness of your bed. If you go for a 0.3 millimeter layer, which is sort of the maximum you could do with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, then you've got three times that margin of error. To try and explain that with a bit more of an example, if you think about printing at a 0.1 millimeter layer height, if your nozzle moves just 0.1 millimeters down, it's gonna to be touching the bed. And at that point, no material is coming out at all. It's gonna be a nightmare. Again, if it moves 0.1 millimeters up, then you've got a twice the separation and you're gonna really struggle to get any adhesion there either, which is a nightmare. Let's think about printing a 0.3 millimeter layer with the same 0.1 variation. If we move 0.1 millimeters into the bed, we've still got a 0.2 millimeters separation. And if we move 0.1 millimeters up, we've got 0.4, which is 133%. So you're not too far over. You should still get some adhesion. You could also drop the nozzle further down and still again have a nice curve where you're getting bed adhesion all around the bed. Hopefully that makes sense. The second reason why increasing your first layer height is beneficial is because you're extruding more material. That material then stays molten for slightly longer because it takes longer to cool down and when it's molten it has more time to really penetrate into the texture of the bed and get a good grip. In the same camp of thinking, some people will suggest to increase your first layer width. I would argue that increasing the first layer height is far more beneficial in, than increasing the first layer width because again, the width doesn't solve the problem of getting your bed perfectly level. And it also, because of the curvature of an extrusion, will be reducing the surface area potentially that you're getting in contact with the material and the bed. So opt for first layer height increasing rather than first layer width. Four, getting your temperature right. So temperature, we've got three things to consider. The bed, the environment, and the nozzle. Let's start with the bed. Most printers these days do ship with a heated bed, which is great because it helps to reduce the amount of temperature variation between the print and the bed. <laughs> Most 3D printers these days do ship with a heated bed, which is great because it helps to improve bed adhesion massively. Some materials you just can't print without a heated bed, for example, ABS. On the whole, bed adhesion will improve the higher you go, 
However, once you start going over the glass transition temperature of the material, the adhesion will start to drop back down or you could have other problems. For PLA, the sweet spot is generally around 50 to 60 degrees C. If you're using an adhesive surface, something like Ultra Base or a Wamban flexible build plate, you might find that they are better at this higher end of the scale because most of them are set up to provide better heat adhesion the higher you go. The second point in temperature is your environment. Now why this plays a difference is it affects how quickly the part cools. The faster the part cools, the more it contracts and the more it will be pulling away from the bed. If you can increase the ambient temperature around the part, then you will slow down this cooling and reduce the contractive forces at play for your part. Now this consideration is far more important for the higher temperature materials like ABS, nylon, for example, but it can still play a part in certain shaped PLA parts or PTG parts. So if you do have an enclosure, that can help a lot. If you don't, you can use settings in your slicer, such as creating a draft shield to effectively enclose some of the heat around the part and increase the cooling time so that the contractions are minimal. Some materials, for example, PA6 nylon, cannot be printed without a heated chamber. So it's worth bearing that in mind if you are trying to experiment with some more high-end materials. The final temperature consideration is your hot end temperature. Generally speaking, you probably want to be going with whatever's on your manufacturer's recommended temperature and probably at the higher end if they offer a range. Reasoning behind this is it ensures the material is molten for longer and again grips into that bed surface better. Five, fan speed. Now, generally speaking for your first layer, you want that fan off completely and for as many layers thereafter as you possibly can. The fan speeds up the cooling and increases the amount of contraction that your part will be going through. So the less fan cooling you can have, the better. Obviously the downside of not having fan cooling is you might struggle with things such as overhangs or bridges, but you can always use your slicer to override in those particular situations. For example, turn on your bridging override, turn on your overhang override for overhangs over 45 degrees, for example. That way you get a good balance between print quality and a reduction in warping. Step six, adhesive, bed surfaces, and bed cleaning. Personally, I'm a fan of bed adhesives because they really do help a hell of a lot and increase the reliability of prints, which is a big thing for me as I hate waste. I would recommend 3D Lac as it provides a good balance between cost and performance. There are a big range of bed adhesives out there. If you look on forums, you'll see people recommending hairspray or Magigoo or PVA or masking tape, or there's a, there's a massive list. But 3D Lac is what I would recommend. And if you are printing with more specialist materials, normally the manufacturer would recommend something specific. If you're against bed adhesives, because they often can leave the bottom of your part a little bit sticky, then your second alternative is an adhesive bed surface, something like a Wamban flexible build plate or ultra base or a powder coated bed. Now for me, things like ultra base don't provide the greatest amount of adhesion at lower temperatures. And so if I'm using those sort of surfaces, I'll print at the higher temperature range and sometimes I'll even also use the adhesive as well. I don't want my parts coming off because it's a waste. So I do over egg it a bit. And the final thing in this section is bed cleaning. If you're against adhesives and you don't have an adhesive bed surface, then you're probably gonna to wanna to make sure your surface is really, really clean as any oils that could come off your fingers or dust from the environment could act as a layer in between your parts and the bed surface. And obviously the print will then adhere to that grime rather than the bed itself. Personally, I never ever clean my beds apart from removing adhesive that's built up over time. So it's sort of my way of thinking that if you follow the other steps correctly, you shouldn't be having too much problems with adhesion by this point. But it never hurts to have a nice clean plate. So if this is your way of doing things, go for it. Another option you have if you don't have an adhesive service and you don't have any adhesive is to consider actually sanding the build surface. Now for something like glass or aluminium, which is very smooth, sanding with a light, say 
400 grit sandpaper and this provides a sort of granular structure where the molten plastic can penetrate into more so on this increased surface area and provide more grip actually works surprisingly well I find okay so that's the first six steps at that point you really should at the very minimum have the first few layers going down perfectly with no signs of warping or separation from the build surface if you haven't then go over them again because I'm pretty confident you will have uh, overlooked something. However, it is still possible that you could see some separation happening later on in the prints. And one of the things you can do to help reduce or prevent this is to add a brim. I'm not a huge fan of using brims because they add extra material which then needs to be removed and that's an extra step in the cleanup process which can be time consuming. However, for some parts they really do make a big difference. For example, printing a part with very sharp edges. At a sharp edge, you've got two sides meeting. Both of these sides will be experiencing contractive forces of their own. So where these two sides meet, you've got two forces pulling the part and that effectively pulls the corner up and you end up with warping at the bottom of your part. The brim is just a little countermeasure in the corner and can generally do quite a good job at preventing this. One thing to note with brims is I find the separation distance really beneficial for getting the best of both worlds between improved adhesion but also easy cleanup. I use a 0.2mm separation and that coupled with a good bit of bed squash ends up with an easy to remove brim that does its job as well. Final step 8 is rafts. I personally hate rafts, again they're a waste of material and they leave the bottom of your print a little bit untidy but I know in some situations rafts are the only way to make something work. I know the original raised printers weren't easy to level and so they suggested using a raft because you effectively just print with this massive fat chunky layer which then everything sits onto. If you're considering rafts as a final ditch resort I'd suggest try increasing your first layer height a little bit more first just to see if that step can fix things for you. And that's it. That's my eight steps to getting perfect bed adhesion. I hope it helps you. If it did, leave a like. If you enjoy this type of video, then do subscribe. Got plenty coming up. Next weekend will be the review of the Zortrax Inventure. If you didn't see the unboxing video, you can catch that here. And yeah, that's everything. See you next time. Cheers.